we have a really exciting show today because Rob always brings the fun uh, and an incredibly talented, versatile artist um, and uh, a real uh, energizer every time he comes to our gallery. Rob was one of our first artists that we ever uh, had in the gallery and he's brought a lot of energy each time he's come. Uh, so I'm very grateful, not only for all of you being here, my team, and Rob. Um, I do want to make an announcement uh, that we are going to be opening. We haven't been slacking much. Uh, we're going to be opening a show at Marie Selby uh, Gardens in Sarasota. So if some of you are near the Sarasota area, you might want to go see the beautiful gardens and see some beautiful glass. Um, but uh, today, uh, I'm really excited to have you here, Rob. And Mary, uh, thank you for pulling all this together and run away with it. Thank you, Duncan. And thanks to Rob for being here and all of you for joining us. Again, as Duncan said, uh, the gallery is a group effort. Irene McClellan, Danielle Bauer, Lauren Hill, Dan Alexander, all of us work together really hard to bring this to you and uh, to keep the gallery open and, and available to show wonderful work uh, in any way that we can. So we appreciate your being part of what we're doing. So today we are hosting Rob Stern. Uh, as Duncan said, amazing friend of the gallery. Energy is his middle name. Uh, <laughs> Rob is known as kind of a mover and shaker among artists and the glass community. We're going to introduce Rob. Rob is in Miami right now. He's just come back from uh, a series of installation projects and uh, you know we're happy to have him here. Um, so Rob, tell us a little bit about your sense of community in the glass world and what that means to you and how you integrate your work into uh, your love of community and socialization. Sure. Uh, first, first of all, thank you guys for having me. It's always great to join you at any point, anywhere. Um, I got pretty lucky to get on board uh, the small studio glass movement in the late 80s when there was a group of people coming out of the 60s uh, who had gone across the country and started collegiate programs um, and, and started interfacing with uh, European glass communities and were influenced on the equipment and some of the techniques. So having a little more than a 30 year run, um, it's been jam packed with all kinds of amazing characters who've been incredibly influential. Um, and, and it's really kind of a small world in a way when you're connected to the various schools and through the galleries uh, and, and of course, an amazing group of artists who are participating in that. Um, so, you know, it, it, from the very beginning, uh, I was extremely lucky to go visit the Pilchuck Glass School, um, which is sort of the epicenter in the world for uh, artists to gather and, and work together and exchange ideas. And having come out of a performing background prior, I was quick to jump into the mix, as it were, and befriend some sort of very uh, important uh, masters from various countries and uh, beg them for the opportunity to go abroad and work in the factories and learn the old world techniques. Um, there was a huge turn in the knowledge here in the States uh, at that time, it, it came kind of out of a out of a ceramics uh, mentality initially, and then with the uh, sort of meetings of the and mixings of these uh, uh, European masters, the level of proficiency quickly shot up through attending these schools in the summertime and mixing in with uh, really age old age old uh, masters. So how did you then uh, take that and decide to open your own studio uh, in Wynwood? 
Yeah, so I actually was overseas working in the factories of Peter Novotny, who was my sort of great friend and master. Um, and at one point I came back to the States, uh, oddly to visit my grandparents here in Miami, uh, cause I'd been traipsing around and gone for quite some time. Uh, and my grandparents were both involved with the University of Miami and they lived next door. And a friend of mine, Martin Blank, who's a, another important glass artist had told me just prior to my return that he had been to the University of Miami and done a glass uh, workshop and I had no idea that they had glass and they actually had a small glass program that was under the guise of ceramics. So I quickly jumped on my grandfather's bike and took off around the block and found the glass shop and immediately ran into the folks who were involved with it and, uh, and we hit it off and there happened to be kind of an opening position as a lecturer and I came right in and we started developing the program with the help of uh, Myrna and Sheldon Paley, we grew the program pretty quickly, um, and 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 it uh, sort of was a hot time in Miami with design. And in the in the early '90s, uh, the Wynwood Arts District was really starting to come about. And I took a studio down there straight away uh, when it was affordable. <laughs> um, and, and, and built my first glass studio as kind of a complement to the school facility because I found that the types of projects that I was getting involved with could not be facilitated in the school setting. Uh, so I expanded my capabilities uh, by creating my own studio, which we've had for close to well, more than 20 years down in Wynwood. So um, it's, it's, it's been an exciting time down here. How do you think the glass art scene has changed in Miami over the... Well, you know, I can first start by saying we are at the edge, at the farthest point away from the real mecca of glass, which is Seattle. So it's been uh, a sort of a long distance relationship with the mainstream community. However, like I said, uh, with the help of some collectors and, and the Habitat galleries, we were able to bring attention to the school. And actually, uh, my I was uh, sort of brought uh, into this by William Carlson, who is another important glass artist. Uh, he came down and we worked together to, to build uh, the, the University of Miami glass program up. And, um, we brought many, many important glass artists, uh, largely people that I had either met in Europe or at Pilchuck or Penland other schools down here to broaden the scope of uh, glass, uh, you know, creation and enthusiasm amongst collectors. So we had a really nice buzz going for many years uh, at the university. Thanks. We're going to uh, actually now go into your studio. We're going to walk through a little bit of Wynwood and uh, see a little bit of the vibe there and then enter your studio. Okay, tell you a little bit about where we're located. It's just slightly north of downtown um, and it is right on the Biscayne Bay sort of corridor. So a lot of uh, art galleries and things of that nature. But what one of the things that Wynwood's highly noted for is the graffiti, uh, which is world-class. Uh, there's my building here, um, but in and around the area where my studios are hundreds, if not thousands of large walls, uh, and which are done by groups of people that come in during Art Basel. And so it's a very lively area with a lot of artists mingling and, uh, you know, meeting one another and encounter influencing uh, from the paint into other mediums. So it's been a really great place to have the gallery. It's right in the heart of Wynwood. So here we enter into, I have a gallery in the middle or front of my studio, which houses a lot of different works that have been created. Much of this work is, I would say over the last 10 years, um, and as you can see, it's an extremely wide variety of objects um, created from glass and other materials. So I work with metal and light and wood at, to largely support 
a lot of the glass pieces and we uh, like to use uh, it to experiment. Um, like for instance, here with the bamboo, these are constructed projects which have metal infrastructures to gain scale. Can those be used outside as well? Are these? We, we, we have made them outside and we've also made them with light inside of them. Um, so yeah, they're, this specific model is, uh, is an interior for an interior design. But you know, what you'll see is just a really eclectic approach to the material. Um, I tend to try and evoke some movement that's largely the common denominator. Um, when we're blowing glass, it's, on, it's on, done on an axis, much like you would spin clay on a wheel. So many times the stuff tends to be symmetrical and I tend to try to work outside of that symmetry as much as possible. So here we enter into the hot shop and we're currently under uh, repair because we're shut down and my people who work with me are, are not uh, attending right now the, the shop but so things are a little in disarray but you walk it's a rather small shop intimate but um, ample for what we like to try to do um, you know it should be noted that a lot of my work is also done in other facilities around the nation and uh, and, and world this is one of the signature series which uh, I've been creating for the last I would say about seven years. Uh, the Wind Stars was sort of a nice formula for creating pieces from molds and putting them th together. But I use a lot of adhesives in my work to gain scale um, and some natural found objects, in this case, uh, fronds, palm fronds from my yard. So has a touch of Florida. You know, look, uh, my fascination with nature is the, is sort of the common denominator in much of the work. Uh, I have various anecdotes that I could tell uh, about raking leaves or watching uh, trees or being in the forest, but paying attention to details in nature has always gathered my attention. And then there's sort of the combination of returning to the glass and figuring out how to distill those ideas through the material. And so it all really boils down to the glass and what we can do with it. Um, but I like to try to reflect on my experiences uh, out in nature. And in large part, it is a kind of a combination between nature and architecture because I live in a, in a pretty prominent uh, architectural city. So it's, it's, there's a sort of a nice, combination between uh, nature and human nature. As you can see here also, uh, this, the, the geometric birds or geometric forms are constantly uh, referring to architecture and structure. But then I like the idea that we can then take that back to more of a liquid form. Uh, here you see leaves that are built into vessels uh, or forms standing together, which all somehow relate to things that I see in nature and then uh, are, are translated through the glass. Of course, crystals, uh, a nice form and uh, palm trees and things. Uh, but I tend to be uh, really loose and free in the way that I approach the material. So with architectural projects and lighting projects like these, I try to find a point of inspiration uh, that has to do with maybe the site where the piece is going. And I'll, I'll roll that into the concept of what we're making so that it has some uh, contextual reference as you say, your, your combination of natural forms and architecture are really impressive. And I know that you do a lot of installation work uh, in, you know, for architectural projects. So it's a beautiful combination. Yeah, it's a, it's a happy place, um, <laughs> you know, where, uh, because uh, look, the way I see it is that we're kind of, uh, there's a symbiotic relationship in most cases that we have with nature, but there's always the case that uh, we're going against the forces 
Uh, we can certainly see that now uh, clearer than ever with the, some of the stuff that's going on uh, is that we're really sort of playing a small part in the bigger picture. And so uh, I try to use my art to describe that uh, displacement or sometimes uh, harmonic convergence um, that we as humans have uh, in this day and age. So here I, we, we move into sort of the guts of the back of the shop and you can see a lot of projects laid out where uh, we will uh, address their construction uh, process. Uh, I work in this way where we have a lot of things laying around and I'll sort of puzzle it together. Um, and so really it sits for a while and uh, we uh, work on a lot of different things at once. Um, in the rear of the facility, we have the cold shop, which is a, a machine shop where we uh, can work on the glass after it's come out of the cooling process. You can cut it and grind it. And much of my work is fabricated together. Um, I've always had a knack for uh, building things and looking for scale. Glass is a difficult material to accomplish large scale in the blowing process. So it's been quite a challenge. And of course you can see it's quite a hodgepodge of uh, activity going on in there. But um, at the end it comes out and, and, and goes you know, into the galleries and, uh, or, and or commission spaces, uh, which inevitably always looks much better than when it's in the back of the studio but it's sort of like orderly chaos uh, in and around there. And again, I got to reiterate that we're in sort of a shutdown period. So things have sort of stacked up, but things move around a lot. And uh, I work at a pretty progressive clip, uh, very prolific style, uh, working on a lot of different things at one time. You have an awful lot of work uh, there. And so do you stop and run from one part of the project to the next part of the project? Or do you try to finish Yes, one? I do, I do. I mean, I, really what it is, Mary, is I have like 20 different projects going on at one time. And so there, I, we never really finish one and then go on to another one. We push all 20 along at the same time. And so then 10 come out at the end of several months, you know. Uh, so it's a, it's a different kind of way of working. Um, for most, as some people tend to need to focus on things. I tend to try to have a lot of things going on at once. And um, in during that time, a lot of things can happen because things are sitting. And so there's time for me to sort of change my mind or make in, you know, uh, improvisational decisions. And frankly, uh, I approach, uh, I, I'm a bit of a musician, so I kind of approach the glass making in a musical way where we sort of have, you know, musical notes that are laying around and I'll build a song uh, out of them as we go. And sometimes it's a flop, sometimes it's a surprise. Um, inevitably we're learning things and I think that's what I'm interested in most. That's uh, beautifully put. Uh, these pieces that we're seeing now, Danielle, can you go back a few pieces? Um, because I believe they're part of an exhibit, aren't they? In right, Biot? so here I've included a uh, most recent exhibit. It's in Biot, France, was last September. And I showed a picture there of a grouping of folks uh, that we got together and I took some of my assistants over. I did a residency for a couple of weeks and actually created a whole body of work, which is now on display. It just opened yesterday for the big Glass Festival, which is in Biot, France. It's an annual festival, and I was supposed to be there featured as a demonstrating artist. Uh, and uh, I found out moments ago that my one of my wind stars, actually one that you see there, is on the front of the magazine for the festival. So that's really a nice, and on the posters. So that's a, that's a nice surprise and accolade there. But the, 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 this was an amazing show because I was able to create a lot of the different types of work in one show. And this was all done in, within two weeks on site um, with a tremendous team, I might add. So some of the pieces like these are put together hot. 
And some of the pieces, and I mean, they're done pretty much start to finish. And then pieces like this are require cold working and, uh, and building after the fact. Uh, and we had quite a bit of success with that show. And now some of those pieces are uh, going off to a couple of museums, as it seems, uh, for a couple of other shows. So that's quite nice. So here, go oh, ahead. This is I'm all saying, the museum show that we just saw? So this is a part of a larger architectural installation that I've been doing some of these recently. Uh, and, you know, it's pieces like this that um, are sort of site specific. Uh, you know, as I said, I'll try to uh, emulate um, either the surroundings or perhaps what activities occur in the building or site so that there's a underlying current or a connection between what um, the building stands for and, and what the art sort of uh, emulates in the space. Uh, and of course, I'm using a lot of light. This is probably a byproduct of the old neon days in Miami, but uh, here we're using LEDs so that you can alter the colors of pieces or not have, have them on at all. So it's, it's a nice sort of new frontier in the work. And these are uh, stools for sitting, furniture. Uh, this is a recent commission uh, for a private home in West Palm. And you can see the, the stools and then the wall installation all up top. So these are the types of projects that we're constantly working on. And architects and designers are coming to me and looking to fill spaces. Of course, a lot of the stuff that I do is sea related, being a diver and a surfer and a sailor. Uh, we're moving into now uh, the, a museum in Dania Beach, Florida. The W uh, Moda Museum had just made a really large acquisition of my work um, this year. So we've been facilitating those, the installation of all those works into this museum. And it's a large collection of Chihuly and some of uh, my other forefathers and contemporaries work. So it's quite a nice, uh, you know, inclusion into a beautiful collection uh, of work. This is a constellation of the Windstar pieces. You can see some of the Chihuly's flanking and old William Morris's and uh, the collector who acquired all these pieces, came to my studio and looked into the uh, archives as it were and was taken back by a lot of the uh, experimentation that we had done and uh, wanted to commission me to do some other pieces like the coral reef and which we've now included in the collection and some of these newer perch bird pieces that I'm doing. I also make paintings. These are about 20, 25 years of doing these kind of action paintings with glass. Pyro pyrography is a burning technique on wood. Um, so I'm showing you just a number of the pieces, but these have become pretty instrumental in a lot of facilitating uh, architectural spaces over the years and, and uh, interior spaces. Printing with glass, hot glass. So in the end here, I just want to show a few pictures of some of the classes that I've done. This is in Minnesota last this January, which was interesting. And there's in Turkey, a class. And, you know, it always comes back down to the sort of group activities uh, that we get involved in because glass inevitably requires a team to make, uh, to make things. Well, that, that's a wonderful tour, Rob, and uh, we have a few questions. Uh, Christine asks, how many people are working on your team per department? I mean, you have so many different aspects of what you're doing in that studio. Well, I kind of wish that they were there working so you could see, uh, but I've got a, a couple of people who work with me uh, more or less full time, and then I bring different people in for different things. Um, but we could have up to uh, 10, as Duncan pointed out, we, and you'll see this in the next clip, we did uh, a demonstration for the gas conference uh, last year in 
St. Pete, and we had up to 22 people working on a large piece. Um, and, you know, we don't always work together all the time, but what's fabulous about the glass industry and really the community and, and club, if you will, is that it's a kind of a language that we all speak and you can, you can really put together a group of the people on the spot. Um, people sort of know what to do. Uh, and, and it's in that part of it is such a fascinating, um, you know, therapeutic way of working with the material because you're sharing all of these actions and ideas with people. And it's getting the young people of tomorrow excited about what the possibilities. So you mentioned music also, and Joni asks what you play. And I think that actually uh, playing together is very related to working together in a, in a hot glass studio. It really is. Unfortunately, uh, Pilchuck was, didn't happen this summer. Uh, I've been at Pilchuck for 30 summers and we play a lot of music. We get together and uh, when we're not, we make a lot of instruments from glass actually. And I've done a full orchestra of glass up there before, but actually this summer we were gonna be having some professional musicians come and I was gonna be a TA working with them and other musicians to create music from glass. Um, so it's, it, it has an incredible capability of resonance. Uh, I actually have a background in performing and singing. I play uh, percussion instruments and uh, dabble in a few other instruments. So uh, the way that we work in the hot shop is very dance and music oriented. Uh, we usually have loud music playing while we're working, uh, but it's a kind of an orchestration that occurs. It has to happen on a timeline, which is like a score, and it has to be completed and finished and go into an oven, which is like recording a song. So there are some real similarities that uh, bring the uh, musical uh, background of myself and, and others to the glass making arena. So how do you think you've influenced others with your uh, glass work and your teaching and your overall energy? Well, I wish we could pick up a few people who could answer that question <laughs> because I'm sure there'd be some stories. But, um, you know, I was heavily influenced by a group of, of wild folks uh, when I got into it in my 20s. And I, that just um, sort of spilled over um, in my uh, techniques of teaching. Uh, we, as I said, have groups of people that get together at these sort of summer camps and we're free to kind of do what we want. Uh, and so I push the boundaries, maybe the limits sometimes a little much. Uh, I think there's probably been a slew of rules created around some of the things that I've done. Uh, but inevitably there's a lot of students who will come back to me and say, man, I can't believe what that session that we did and all the crazy stuff that we did. And it's been years of building on games and activities and group dynamics that I do with the classes that I try to break down any of the sort of preconceptions that people bring when they come to a class. You know, they come, they're nervous that they don't have the level of skill or what. And we try to just sort of flatten that idea the, and, and, and sort of even the playing field by including everyone in everything that we're doing. We, we try not to have any hierarchical approach to the material. I mean, certainly there's the gaffer who's sort of steering the team or orchestrating the class, but um, a good director will sort of bounce others' ideas off of each other and try to get people to work together. And, uh, and then in the end, the takeaway is really all of the inspiration that I get from the energy uh, that's you know twelvefold, if there's twelve students, or it's a it's a an amazing thing that's really become pretty addictive. Uh, these these summer school outings, which are two or three weeks long. So it sounds as if your approach is almost like theater, or maybe even jazz. It's like jazz. It's very much. I talk to them about improvisation because when you're making glass in the hot shop, everything can go wrong. And it tends to. And if you don't learn how to roll with that, uh, those mistakes, right? And you know, we use the term happy accidents a lot. Much of my work has been sort of uh, looking at the things that are happening outside of what we're trying to do and 
seeing uh, the accidents sort of teaching us about what else is possible because, you know, we sort of see how it's supposed to be done, you know, and we of course want to learn that way. But then there's like so much more and how do you find that? And so by doing, by approaching it in an improvisational way and setting up sort of the, uh, the stage for it um, and then allowing those accidents to be not, you know, mistakes, um, then we discover things that uh, we wouldn't normally find in sort of a regular exercise. Well, I know that you, uh, we all know that you have been a great influence on so many uh, artists that you've worked with. And so how important is it to you to be an influencer in your industry? And, and how can you find even further ways to spread this message? It's a great question. Um, you know, certainly now with the internet um, and the way people are learning, you know, they'll go to YouTube and learn how to make a Venetian goblet. So that's sort of taken the sort of made skill commonplace. And my sort of idea of, uh, getting people to look outside that box is always my, my first challenge um, because I, I'm kind of tired of things that have already been made. Um, you know, I've learned to make them. It's important to build your skill set so that you can move on to, uh, with the material uh, with, you know, proficiently. But um, in terms of influencing people, um, you know, there's nothing better than having somebody make something and them feel good about showing it to other people. And so with every class that I teach, we end the class with an exhibition. And, and this is true of Corning and Penland and, and Europe and all the classes that I do, we start the class by announcing that you're gonna be working on a piece or two or three for an exhibition. And all of a sudden that changes the format of the whole thing. And it, it creates a goal oriented uh, you know, uh, exercise where people have to sort of go through the steps to do what it, to do what is necessary to say, show pieces in the professional world. And so that, uh, you know, a lot of times is a slap in the face <laughs> and it's a wake up call. Um, people tend to sort of hide behind their comfort zone. And so I feel like by sort of stripping down the, uh, the normality of what we do and presenting an anarchy of sorts, um, then it creates a, an alternative path that people can discover something a little bit different about themselves, you know, than what they brought to the class. And so they walk away feeling energized and inspired. Uh, and like with the class that we're gonna be doing up there, finding your way, um, you know, it's difficult to find your way with any material. Um, sometimes it comes more naturally to some than others. But uh, if I can help somebody get on to or make steps closer to their style, uh, I feel like we've made some real accomplishments. Uh, let's take a look at some of the places that you've taught and some of the people that you've worked with. I've been a, a lucky fella to be able to have my art and glass take me to many interesting and fascinating places where glass is made. Um, and as I said, uh, it's, a, it's a group activity. It's a, it's a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a club, a cult, <laughs> um, which, uh, you know, is so much fun. And this is, this is a sofa in Chicago. This is the Corning mobile unit and doing some more perform, performance oriented glass making there. This is making um, the centerpiece designs at Pilchuck uh, for their large auction. Uh, doing some experimenting with some of the other techniques that I use and um, a piece like this, as this is made at another sofa in the Ignite Studios in Chicago, you know, this takes a week to put together and a team of 10 people. So it all relies on a group uh, effort. 
Uh, this is in Turkey, um, which again, you know, even though I don't speak that much Turkish, uh, we tend to be able to speak through the material. So it's really a neat way to connect with people. This is Jason Christensen from the Chihuly team, and we're creating a large leaf vessel here in the gaffer station at Pilchuck. These things couldn't be done without the expertise of many of these artists. These are all professional artists or burgeoning uh, artists. This is at the Duncan, the famed Duncan McClellan Gallery for the Glass Society Conference last year. And as I said, a large team to put together a lot of sort of pre-made parts that we heated up for the Sea Dreamer, which is a Dreamer series. And then here just shows sort of a sped up version of what it looks like when we're putting together a piece. And you can see the kind of dance that's happening, right? And I'm sort of the orchestrator that's helping to build these pieces. And for those of you who don't know about making glass, it's extremely complex material to keep alive. That is to say that we bring it from the furnace into the studio, we work with fire, we have to keep it above a certain temperature. If any one part of it falls below that temperature, it cracks and the whole game is over and you kind of got to start over. So it's a delicate dance that requires high coordination and orchestration. Um, and uh, there's a real team feeling that builds. And you know, that's just built incredible relationships over the years. Love that phrase, keeping the glass alive. Yeah, like in this case, uh, you know, who wouldn't want a cowboy riding a bunny on a carrot rocket? <laughs> but it's these kind of gatherings, and this is at the Pratt Institute in Seattle for, uh, for a conference uh, where we've just really put three artists together and collaborated on the spot. And, and that's the real beauty that keeps bringing you back to the studio and, and getting together with these people is that it's sort of an anything goes approach to the material, which is uh, a great way to, to, to live, you know. Well, that's pretty amazing. Um, and you, yeah, you show all kinds of techniques. You show hot glass on the pipe, which we're pretty familiar with, but also mold blown. And, and do you use any cast glass also? We do. I mean, really, there, there's nothing we won't use. Um, which what, what's, I guess, important to point out there is that, you know, I've spent my life traveling around the world, literally following the, the, the trends in learning about different techniques of glass. And so by having a very expansive knowledge of how glass is made and having worked with casters, I mean, I spent years working for John Lewis, who's a big caster in Oakland, this massive castings and learning how to fabricate large uh, pieces together. Um, of course, I'm drawn to the blowing because it's, as a youngster, that's, it's a bit of a sport that translates into some of the other sports uh, like surfing and skating and rock climbing and things that it's a, it's a very hand-eye coordinated sport. So having all those different disciplines under your belt, you can draw on any one of those techniques at any given point to facilitate the idea that you may have. And I might add, when I'm teaching people we'll try to approach an idea or a project in a, several different ways via casting or blowing or fusing or whatever it is. And it may be some combination of those things that ultimately arrives us at the techniques that will help develop a series for somebody. So uh, I, you know, I can't say enough about um, expanding sort of your knowledge of how the glass is made and how other people are using it. I mean, now with the social networking I, every day, I, waking moment is looking on Instagram or Facebook or what and seeing what people are doing and seeing what galleries are showing and what collectors are interested in because you know it's a uh, it's a conversation uh, it's a dialogue um, that we're doing between creating and and collecting well we love that your approach is so alive and we're going to uh, show a little clip about some of the work we just saw in the studio. And we'll uh, please, Rob, talk about the different techniques that are used in those pieces, because there's so many different techniques here. Sure. Well, it'll probably move pretty quickly, but I mentioned the leaf vessel. So these are cast and then built together hot from on a pipe. 
Uh, these are large pieces. They're, they're quite heavy. They require a coordinated team effort. Um, and there's a high fa failure rate because they're put together in a very dainty way so that there are spaces that move in between the pieces. I look at them as being almost like Indians had made them from leaves to carry water or something like this, you know, it's sort of like a vessel and nature, the leaf vessel. And then this sort of signature Windstar series is made from blowing into molds and then manipulating the glass once it's out of a mold, cooling the glass and then fabricating the 13 pieces that make up this together. Here too, these pieces are made individually and then cold fused together to create this sort of phenomenal balance um, of them standing on these points. So for me, it's always uh, a challenge to find some new way to construct the work. Um, and then of course, doing things with uh, other materials to support the glass is expanding the, uh, you know, the capability for scale and architecture is, is rather important. Uh, and here again, uh, the cast leaves, which are manipulated hot in the hot shop and two sort of lighting and more. You'll see quite a few of the wind stars. They tend to be a pretty popular uh, series right now. And they're made in six different sizes up to 36 inches. So, and those, those can weigh almost 200 pounds. So um, it's, it's challenging. And then I do a lot of architectural installation. This is a neat way of making things that are molded, blown, but then spreading them out so I can cover large areas. So we just finished with one 30 foot wall of pieces like this uh, in a game room, in a, uh, in a uh, uh, place here that has a fun game type kind of quality to it, almost like a pin the tail or a type of thing. Um, and again, the gathering series. But you know, these series are built over um, cr crunching the drawing book over years. Uh, and it, it's only about, it seems like every five years you sort of get struck by lightning with a series that sort of sticks. You figure out a technique of putting something together and then you elaborate on that series. And so many of these series have been running for several years. And these are bubble strands, mirrored bubbles on cables. And we did, as you saw, a large chandelier out of these. And then we are doing some architectural installation with them in this case. And the bamboo, again, segmented pieces created by hand and then constructed together to create this sort of bamboo forest. And the wind stars are continuing to hold my attention for a while. The movement is, uh, is different in every one. So every time you put one together, it's a little bit like a surprise, which is a nice, you know, a nice way of working because I never know what they're gonna, gonna look like uh, in the end. Um, and as I said, putting blown work together in construction uh, is, is a pretty complex uh, because they're, it's somewhat fragile. And so building things that are structurally sound is, uh, is always a challenge in learning how to do that. In this case, with the spurs. Uh, and uh, again, the movement is intoxicating and, and a surprise. And um, this perch series is a rather new one that I'm visiting. Um, we're doing some little bit larger scale ones now. Uh, and again, this is sort of that interplay between nature and my art, whereby I found these fronds, you know, in the yard essentially here, and I'm kind of looking at them and thinking, hey, we could blow glass into them, you know, and, and create these wall pieces. So in that case, just working directly with nature. And in this case, really referring to architecture, um, which, you know, I'm surrounded by here on Miami Beach where I live is, is, is a World Heritage Site for uh, Art Deco, so it's uh, influential. 
Thank you, Rob. Does anyone have any uh, questions that they'd like to address to Rob specifically? I know Jason has uh, Jason Chakravati with us, and oh, he hey, said, hey, Jason. Uh, he Love said, oh, <laughs> videos make me miss the hot shop, and I'm yeah. sure that uh, there are some other artists watching who, um, who feel that way as well. Yeah, Jason, I'm right with you there, uh, man. It's a, we, we've. Uh, it's been a tough run, but you know we'll get back to it. And uh, just remember that we're all still here, and the and the hot shops are there, and we'll we'll be up and running and back together soon. I hope. Um, I'm feeling it from everybody right now. Um, hopefully, you can find a place and some folks to work with soon. Well, Lauren uh, Hill, who is our uh, DMG School Project Manager and Director. And uh, she says she can't wait to have your energy and skill back in the hot shop. And of course we are having you back in October. So I don't know if you and Duncan would like to discuss a little bit uh, what's going to happen in October for the gallery and the DMG school project. Duncan? Duncan's music. Yeah, music. we're really excited to have uh, you come to a master class. And, uh, you know the fun that Rob brings to uh, a class anyway, and uh, some of our participants have been in our classes. Um, they're made for people that generally haven't blown glass, haven't done glass before. Those so are everybody is a newbie to it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a really energizing weekend. You participate in what we do, uh, when we bring in uh, artists like Rob uh, and the lectures and the um, events that we have in the evening. But it's three days of classes that you really walk out learning a great deal, making a wonderful piece or two. And more than anything, it's probably one of the most fun experiences you'll ever have. And we figured out a way to do it safely. So uh, we look forward to you coming in October. Uh, we're going to have a ball. Um, so thank you for doing that. Absolutely. By I the way, go ahead. I noticed in one of the uh, when you were at Pilcha, uh, you had Fred Call there. Uh, right. When were you uh, working with Fred? That was last summer, and Fred, Fred and I, uh, Fred and I have done some stuff together. Um, he's got an incredible approach. To the material and, and creating molds and I did a class up there with him uh, actually last summer uh, where we were cutting uh, CNC machines cutting graphite to create casting molds and then casting into them and building forms in the hot shop so that's what you saw us doing there and uh, I would urge anyone to visit with Fred he's all all around and has an, an also an incredible energy in teaching and coming to the shop but I would like to add a little something. I'd first like to say that you've built an incredible facility and really a uh, sort of a mecca for glass in the St. Pete area. And, and we were lucky enough to have the glass conference come there last year and have the Florida glass scene under, uh, under the uh, watch of uh, our community, um, which was really exciting. And having you know, this community in, in Florida grow through events like what you're doing with these classes and uh, and showing uh, in the gallery is greatly appreciated. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a great pleasure and certainly we're going to approach it with kid gloves uh, for safety um, and make sure that everyone uh, <clears throat> feels comfortable uh, given the uh, circumstances. But uh, we're going to have a great time and uh, however it is that we expedite it, it's going to be fantastic. Um, and so I am looking forward to it very much. Thank, Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, we're also uh, launching, Rob will help us launch a new program in North Pinellas County at the Creative, Creative Pinellas location. There'll be an exhibition of Rob's work and, and other glass artists as well, but Rob will be the, the premier artist uh, opening that project. So that will be the third weekend of October. And it's a very exciting development, again, uh, helping to bring and expand the knowledge of glass art uh, throughout the West Coast 
and what, what is now known as the glass coast of Florida. So um, really excited to have you uh, come down and launch that project, Rob. And um, let's see, um, someone else, Joni, and uh, several people have asked, where can they get that beautiful t-shirt that you're wearing? <laughs> Well, I happen to have them for sale right here. Uh, <laughs> if you want to visit uh, me at my website, uh, robsternartglass.com, uh, we can uh, communicate there. And I can certainly see uh, that you get a hold of one. We have hats, too. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun uh, logo that plays on the idea of sport uh, in, in the U.S., as it were, for glass. Uh, hi, Lauren. Yes. <laughs> Just saw you there. More questions, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask, how do you fuse the, the stars together? Hi. Hi. How are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. Well, uh, <laughs> since last November. November. I actually, I was in Biot last December, uh, last September. We could have met. I just missed you. Yes. Ah, well, uh, to answer your question, um, I'm using some gla uh, glass adhesives formulated for glass. Um, and there's a considerable amount of cold working and fitting, right, to get the pieces to fit together. But it's been a long process of developing the this sort of methodology of uh, getting them to be archival. And um, we're building them where they're, they're hanging and on walls and for lighting. And so uh, every time we're building a new one, it's a new challenge. Um, so we, we're developing new techniques with different adhesives, but uh, large, largely it's a construction process. Thanks, Natasha. Um, we'd like to thank Rob again for spending this time and all of you uh, for spending this time with us again on Friday afternoon. Uh, next uh, Friday, we have Aya Oki, who was actually a resident artist at the DMG School Project. Um, and Rob, you may have worked with Aya as well, but I know some, some of the other artists present have. Sure, sure. Yeah. I'll be tuned into that for sure. She's fascinating, doing some fabulous work. Thanks. And uh, everyone be sure to pay attention and stay tuned for Rob's class and his visit to the gallery. And uh, thank you for joining us. And Duncan, thank you for making this all possible. <laughs>